after reading your book. Okay. Uh, given that you're just 29 and you know, the kind of information that you've shared with us is quite spectacular. Um, I didn't know uh, the Deccan was as uh, pulsating uh, a place where you know people from the various continents used to come here and live here. I, mean, I didn't have an idea of that at all. Somehow, in spite of being a history student, so that just doesn't get covered. Yeah. Um, and your new book, I mean, it's absolutely engrossing. Spicy gossip, uh, curious characters. Um, and, uh, you know, defiant women, uh, absolutely spectacular. And also, I like the fact that you have framed the stories in slightly different way than the, you know, the rest of the stories, uh, rest of the historical stories that we read, which makes us actually question ourselves, okay? So, we know that India is a young country, yeah, just 72 years old, but it's a, it's a very old civilization. And we are trying to leapfrog into the future as a developed country, you know. I think 5 trillion is what is the latest figures being floated yeah, in terms of the economy. But we have a very complex social structure, very complicated ethnic ethnicity. Um, so in the middle of all this, we are looking for uh, to carve out our identity. Yeah? And right now they are trying to find the purest you know, Indian identity. So as a historian, uh, do you think, first of all, it's possible to have a pure version of India? And second, how do you think history can help us get a perspective, you know, when we are shaping this identity of ours? You know, Devdad in his, in his keynote session spoke about how human behavior doesn't change. And this is something I try to address in my books as well, which is that no matter which century, century you're looking at, no matter what period you're looking at, Human beings tend to behave in very similar manner. And then, you know, we have a, a tendency to turn historical figures into gods. So we like putting them on pedestals and pretending that they were somehow these people who sat with their spines wrecked and thought noble thoughts all day. Whereas in reality, you know, they didn't wake up in the morning thinking it was a golden age. You know, they didn't wake up thinking, ah, they just created a golden age today. They were just going about their business. The difference is that unlike today, where we have a certain cultural insecurity, which causes us to go looking for these pure, pristine elements in the past, which actually never existed. You know, people in the past were like us. They had their flaws, they had their prejudices, they had their weaknesses, and they had their greatness. It wasn't like they were some sort of superhuman uh, creatures. So that, once you understand, you start realizing that Indian history offers far greater than this hackneyed narrative of five dynasties, four kings, uh, and you know, biased thoughts being thought all the time. You know, it's not merely philosophy. It's not merely people talk talking about you know esoteric ideas. They had fun, they had a sense of humor, they had a sense of confidence which allowed them to laugh at themselves. That is what you discover with uh, Indian history. The second essay in this book, I mean, why is the book called, it's got this rather serpentine title, The Courtesan, The Mahatma and The Italian Brahmin. The courtesan could be one of any of the, the half dozen courtesans I have in the book. Because my question really was that, you know, we've done so much Indian history featuring heroes, battles, kings, but where are the women? It's not like the women are absent. And the biggest example of women who've made contributions to culture are courtesans. Yes. They were educated, they were literate, they contributed to culture, they do art, to music, to dance. Uh, Balamani, one of the courtesans in the book, set up a company in the 19th century when most women were still illiterate in this country. A proper private limited company, one of the most successful business enterprises of the time. Uh, in the 18th century, there was this dancing girl in Delhi called Begum Samru, who you know begins life in, in Chandni Chowk in something like a brothel ends up as protector of the Mughal emperor, head of an army of thousands of soldiers, an ally of the East India Company, and dies one of the richest women in India. And in the, in, in the middle of all this, ends up marrying a German, marrying a Frenchman, having an affair with an Irishman, and you know, living a rather full life. Yeah. She tells you a lot about that period at the end of the 18th century and the first half of the 19th century, but we have ignored these women because you know, we like kings and heroes rather than these, these complicated women who don't have Mangal Sutras around their neck, uh, which sort of give them uh, some sort of place. The Kulastri as opposed to the Vishya. Go further back in time and you have Muddubarni in the 18th century writing erotica where I mean, Indian writing often has been sensuous. There's been a lot of self-expression, physicality. But what's interesting about Muddubarni is so far at least she seems to be the only woman who expresses a right to desire for women. Where she says, where it's Radha who's the protagonist and Radha demands physical appeasement from Krishna. Yeah. Even where, you know, Krishna, this is an 18th century poem, where Krishna says at one point in the, in the Radhika Santhanam, 
oh, you know, I'm tired, and still, even when I tell her I'm tired, she begins the game of love. She hops on bed and begins the game of love. This is the kind of thing that happened in the 18th century. But 100 years pass, and we get colonized not only in terms of our lands, but also in our minds by the Victorians. And suddenly, we're very uncomfortable with this Vaishya saying these things. So when they publish her book in the late 19th century, they pretend that it was written by a man called Muddu Pillai. Because you were more comfortable acknowledging that men could talk about desire and physicality and sex, but not a woman. And then when a woman tried to publish the full uh, unabridged version, they banned it. Till after independence. So the women are all there. You know, the courtesans in the title represent that. The Mahatma represents not Mahatma Gandhi, as people might imagine, although there is an essay on Gandhiji. It represents Mahatma Pule. Because this is the other person where we've garlanded him as a reformer, a social reformer, rather blandly. Put him up on a pedestal and say, okay, he, he got a few reforms done. But his was also a radical mind. This was a man who, you know, when he, he grew up and lived in Pune, his grandfather was a gardener, uh, his father was a greengrocer. And, uh, you know, when Pune is, was ruled by the Peshwas, you know, the seat of Brahmin orthodoxy in Western <laughs> India. And when they said that Brahmins are superior because they were born from the head of the cosmic creator or something along those lines, Pule is the man who turned around and said, does that mean the cosmic creator menstruated through the mouth? Because he was, he was capable of standing up and saying that. Uh, look back a few centuries, Kabir, another essay in this book, where someone says the Brahmin was born from the head of the cosmic creator, he says, were well, you delivered to the ear? Yeah. You go back to the 12th century and you have a Basava who says, loaded with the weight of the, of the Vedas, the Brahmin is a veritable donkey. The point is not, it's not anti-Brahmin, but the point is polemical thought, radical thought is also part of Indian culture. It wasn't merely people sitting there and you know, talking about the Shastras and wondering about great esoteric concepts. They were able to stand up, they were able to question, they were able to sort of, uh, you know, evolve their personalities and ask tough questions as well. So that's the, the Mahatma in the title. And the Italian Brahmin, of course, represents the singular colorful figure in the early 17th century. You know, we have this notion that uh, Christianity perhaps you know, largely came in the, in the colonial era. Of course, it's been here for much longer. But the Italian Brahmin represents this man called De Nobili, Roberto De Nobili from Italy, who comes here as a missionary in 1604, very quickly transfers himself from Portuguese Goa into Madurai, and decides that you know, he doesn't want lower caste members, he wants Brahmins to come. So he says, to, become, to, to get the Hindus, I'm going to become a Hindu. What does he do? So he gets there, throws off his Jesuits, cloak or cassock or whatever, and starts wearing the Puru of the Brahmin. Starts draping the saffron cloth around his waist like a sannyasi, learns Tailugu, learns Tamil, learns uh, Sanskrit, starts debating uh, the Brahmins on the Vedas and so on, which he dismisses, of course, as, as stuff and nonsense. And then presents the Bible as a lost fifth Veda. And goes around like this, and where there were zero converts, he manages to raise thousands of converts, including a prince, including very many Brahmins, simply by Hinduizing his Catholic faith. So when he landed in India, he brought Roman Catholicism, but what he did in Madurai was an Indianizing of Catholicism. At one point, in fact, one of his colleagues said that, you know, this is against our thing. If you're converting, you have to convert uh, completely, you know, external as well as, well as internal uh, appearance and manifestation of thought. And uh, he, what he does is he turns around to this fellow and says, you know, I am now a Brahmin, so there's a caste system between us, so I cannot eat with you. Only Brahmin cooked food served on his plantain leaf, because the plate is now too European, and he won't eat out of plates, he eats out of a plantain leaf. His superiors in Goa, apoplectic, they summon him to Goa saying, you know, how can you do this, you must come here and answer. He goes there and he refuses to eat with them also, saying, that I am now a Brahmin, you people are nature's, you are white people, and you know, I am no longer one of you. So he's a singular character, and you don't, when you realize that the three major themes in the book is caste, gender, but also quirk, the fact that Indian history is full of quirky, eccentric human figures who are not gods, they're not divine, they're not people put on pedestals, they're human beings. And because they're human beings, they're interesting. And that is how we need to understand history, because once you realize that people in the past were just like you and me, yeah. the past comes alive better. Because we get rid of this hypocrisy, we get rid of the, the moral lens that we've applied to the past and start realizing that the riches of the past are all there. So, so basically we see them for what it is. <laughs> So, uh, so I have a loud voice, so I normally don't need the mic. Um, yeah, so fundamentally what you're saying is that we need to see them as human beings with a little dose of psychology, a little bit of sociology, and a little bit of economic lens, and then understand them as just regular human beings who've not gone out to create history, but history of what we yeah. Okay, so, uh, you know, the, one of the stories that is very interesting in your book is about the Amachis. You know, the matriarchal thing. You talk about it. That's I think, you know, the last time I was at the Mysore Fest, which was two years ago, I had, I had talked about this, uh, the Travancore oil family, which is the subject of my first book, and how, uh, you know, matriarchy, it wasn't matriarchy, it was matriarchy, 
which meant that you know the, the king and his wife and kids did not constitute the family. The family was, to put it simplistically, king, sister, and her kids. And this continues among the Nayas even today. So technically, my father and I are not members of one family. He belongs to his sister's family. I belong to my mother's family. In the royal family, this gets complicated because the king's wife is not the queen. She's merely the Amici. And the title can be translated as the mother of his highness's children. That's about it. So the Travanko Maharaja, the, the penultimate Maharaja's title was His Highness Sri Padmanabha Dasa Vanchi Pada Sri Amulam Dirna Rama Varma Kula Shekara Kirita Padna Mani Sultan Maharaj Raj Ram Raj Bahadu Shamsher Jan. And plus two, three English titles. His son was simply Mr. Vilayadun Tambi. The son was not a highness, the son was not a prince. And the son, the father would not attend the daughter's wedding because the daughter is a private citizen. And this exists for the queen's as well. The queen's husband is only the consort. So the queen's husband cannot sit in her presence. The queen hus queen's husband cannot address her by name. He is to call his wife, Your Highness. Uh, you know, at, at my favorite is at feasts in the palace. The Maharani was served four varieties of dessert. The husband got two. Oh, nice. <laughs> every, every time she entered or left the capital, they had this grand 21 gun salute, all the cannons rolled out. For her husband, it was a simple rifle salute at the gate of the palace because there's nothing more than that. That's lovely. He had no business dying in the palace because the palaces were only for members of the royal family. So when uh, the Maharani's consorts were dying, they were lifted with their court and taken away elsewhere to die because they could not defile the royal family's properties by dying in them. And the queen and her children, this man's kids, would not attend the funeral because he may be the husband, he may be the father, but he's an ordinary subject of the royal family. He's not a member of the royal family. Uh, the, another, you know, in the 1910s, Maharani Sethu Lakshmi Bai was just considered uh, the British like this because they thought, what a great reformer. Because she uh, got a note from her uncle saying, news has reached me that, you know, you have been seen driving around in the same car with your husband. He's not supposed to sit in the same car with your husband. If he sits next to you, what does it signify? Equality. Yeah. He has to follow in another car. He cannot sit in the main limo in which the Maharani goes. So there are all these rules, all these customs that existed. Go to Kerala now and suggest this to people and they've forgotten. They have no idea that this is how this, the system was over there. The Amachis, of course, because they were wives of Maharajas, they, they had specific mansions, you know, so there were soldiers who stood guard. They had all the privileges of royalty except the titles. Whereas the Rani's consorts, they had some more of a, a glorified position because at least they were fathering the next generation of the, of the royal family. But they had no rights in terms of naming the kids. They had no rights whatsoever. And the kids outranked the father. That was how it worked. Yeah, um, like I was telling you yesterday, I also belong to a patriarchal, uh, you know, from Mangalore, of course. Um, the other thing that I liked about, uh, you know, your earlier book, uh, and you have mentioned this in this as well, where you have isolated religion, and, you know, uh, historically seen how religion has been used as a currency by various people, you know, different religions and how they have tailored their you know, uh, message for either their uh, citizens or you know, people who belong to their world. Yeah. Could you talk about that? It's very, very interesting. What interests me generally is power dynamics. What is interesting is how edifices and, and, and structures of power are constructed. And every time you construct a structure of power, you need something called legitimacy. Yes. Because at the end of the day, power is a very fragile thing. Yeah. Now, you know, this, uh, the Maharani of Travancore, Till 1949, when the integration of the states takes place, she's got 300 servants in her palace. Every time she comes down from the first floor to the ground floor, there are these household guards who have to bow not six times, not eight times, exactly seven times, you know, touching the ceiling all the way to the ground. It's a very ceremonious lifestyle. You know, everything about her, every time she goes for a walk in the garden, there are 15 people following her. Someone holding up a parasol, someone has bodyguards. Every time she travels, there are outsiders. There's this whole sense of this person being extraordinary. That's what this is trying to reinforce. Exactly, I mean, less than 10 years later, by 1956, the communist movement comes. The same palace, her own servants form a communist union, and they hoist a communist flag on top of the palace. All it took was a decade. Yes. Powers, the moment power slips away, things change very quickly. Yes. Which is why people in power always realize that in addition to hard power, you needed legitimacy. Yes. Now, how do you legitimize yourself? In the, you know, the ancestor of the Stravinko family, they called Martanda Varma. He conquered a number of kingdoms. Now, wherever he went, they said, you're a conqueror, you're an outsider. What does he go? He, go, he do? He goes to the Padmanabha Swami temple and in a grand ceremony, he lays his sword in front of the deity and donates or surrenders his conquest to the deity. Mm -hmm. So till yesterday you could criticize the king. Now you can't criticize the king because he represents God. That's the state belongs to the God. If you're criticizing the king, you're criticizing God. Correct. The other thing he does is he constructs a very artificial vocabulary around the royal family. Also to reinforce power. 
So for instance, if you and I wake up in the morning, in Malayalam we'd say Panadeka, to what, brush your teeth. In the royal family, it's called Tirumutta Vilak, a cleaning of the royal pearls. Because even the language used has to be that in Yeah. Yeah, when the queen is pregnant, queens are never pregnant. They don't do things like giving pearls. When the queen is pregnant, it's called Tiruvayar Vanu, the royal womb is occupied. When the queen gives birth, she does not give birth. The royal womb is vacated. That's how it happens. When, when a, a member of the royal family dies, you say Nad Nimi, which means you have, you've stopped ruling this kingdom, you're going to the next kingdom to rule. The heavenly kingdom. Yes, yes. You know, there's this funny custom where uh, every, kings obviously couldn't go to get moksha if their sins were, were intact. So every time a Maharaja was on his deathbed, they summon a Tamil Brahmin, get him to come and hug the Maharaja and sort of assume all the Maharaja's <laughs> sins. He was paid 10,000 rupees, taken to the border of Tabinko and shut and sort of you know, pushed out of the border so that he could disappear with the sins and the king could comfortably go to his, his maker. All of this is doing what? It's trying to reinforce power. It's trying to create legitimacy constantly. If, if, you, if the king looks like he's you and me, there's, no, there's nothing special about it. Anyone can spill royal blood. But when royal blood becomes sacred, that is when it has value. So even with religion, you know, you, you look at this 1965 battle where Vijayanagar collapses, for example. This is often presented as this clash of empires. Where it's a Hindu empire being destroyed by a bunch of Muslim sultans. But it's very complicated if you scratch just under one layer of the surface. So you find that in Vijayanagar, the emperor, the de facto emperor leading the charge for Vijayanagar, began his career in Golconda under the Kutub Shah, who was a sultan. He happened to marry Krishnadevaraya's daughter in law, that's why he moved over to this side. The Adil Shah of Bijapur, one of the sultans who defeated Vijayanagar, was the adopted son of the emperor of Vijayanagar. Uh, the Nizam Shah who was there was descended two generations before from a converted Brahmin and they still maintain relationships with their Brahmin uh, relatives. Yes, yes. The Kutub Shah who defeats the Vijayanagar Emperor at this battle had spent seven years of his life in exile in Vijayanagar where he married a Telugu woman. A Telugu is his name from Ibrahim to Abhirama yeah. and, or Malik Brahma and uh, married a Lok woman, patronized poetry on the Mahabharata. A Shetraya composed 1500 padams of bhakti poetry in the court of the Kutub Shah because the Kutub Shah is the great uh, patron of the Telugu. Yeah. Uh, there were 6,000 Marathas fighting at this battle of Talikota, the so-called Hindu-Muslim thing, but they were on the Muslim side. They were fighting for the yeah. Sultans. Yeah. There was a celebrated Muslim ge general called Ainul Mul Kilani. He was fighting for the Vijayanagar Emperor, and the only inscriptional record of him has him donating land to 80 Brahmins. So, but does that mean religion did not exist? No, there were bigots. Yes. There were people who used yes. religion then as today yes. for political purposes. Yes. But the other thing we should realize is that often you cannot take texts and records at face value. This is a time when there's no nationalism. Political ideas are not evolved in that sense. Religious vocabulary is the way in which you express your sense of self, your identity, and your kingly vision. So the emperors of Vijayanagar expressed themselves in the Sanskritic vocabulary because that's the tradition they came from. Yeah. The, uh, the sultans in the north, the Bahmani sultans, for example, expressed themselves in an Islamic fashion because Persian roots and Persian culture was what they were aspiring for. True. Does that mean the two parties did not meet or have anything in common? Not true. You go to Tirupati, you look at the, the famous bronze of Krishna Devaraya there, he's wearing a Turkish hat. Because it was fashionable in Vijayanagar to wear Turkish, uh, Persian clothes. Yeah. Uh, you know, you go to look at Hampi and the sculptures. The earliest or the oldest stage of the sculptures there, they're just wearing that uh, the munda or the thing around your waist, yeah. which is that typical yeah. South Indian yeah. costume. As the generations pass, you start seeing the tunic, a very Persian tunic, and you start seeing these conical yes. hats, yes. which is also part of a Persian thing that's come. So the women of Vijayanagar were not walking around wearing saris, they were walking around wearing conical hats with jewels and gems uh, sort of embroidered into it and things like that because they were absorbing Persian influences. Yeah. You know, the, the Karun chief minister of Maharashtra, his name is Devendra Fadnavis. Fadnavis is a Persian word. He's a Brahmin, but his surname is Persian. The Peshwas who ruled in Pune, they were orthodox Brahmins. They're the ones who said, you know, all Dalits must walk around with brooms attached to their waists so that even when they walk, the, the, the footprints are sort of wiped away automatically. Yeah. Their type of Peshwa is a Persian word. The Peshwas, they were orthodox Brahmins, but they were also attracting a lot of interesting uh, cultural elements. There's, there are records of somebody wearing a rat skin shirt in the Peshwa court. Elk skin pants. I don't know who was wearing these things, but clearly they had a sense of fashion that was slightly bewildering. But it was there. They weren't sitting there saying, chanting mantras already saying they're Brahmins. No, they were engaging with the world. Yes. All cultures do that. Your religion may define your sense of identity, but it does not preclude conversation with other powerful entities. You know. It also depends on how you look at these things. So we often think that Islam came to India from the north when you know, the first swords were raised in the Sindh. Yeah. Factually incorrect because in the very lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, the first mosque was constructed in Kerala. Now some say the mosque isn't that old, but in any case, two centuries later, you have uh, a royal grant by a Hindu king witnessed by Muslims who are actually signing a royal grant in, in Arabic. Their signature was all in Arabic. 
So in any case, by the 9th century, they were influential enough to be signing royal drafts. So they were an important community. Absolutely. So how did Islam come to India? Yeah. Not in the Sindh with, with swords, but through peaceful embassies of commerce. Yeah. You look at the architecture of the old mosques in Kerala, it's the same Asharis as we call them, using the same Tachushastra, who built temples and who also built the neighboring mosque. They look the same. It's much later that the dome and the minaret, etc., comes into the south. So depending on which part of the country you're looking at, the equation changes, the narrative changes. So it, it does get very complicated in that sense, but the point is religion existed, religion gave people a sense of identity and worth, but it was not, I think, the guiding factor of their lives. Avarice, greed, ambition, these were the things that often guided politics on the ground, and, and at the end of the day, personal quirk, because a lot of it eventually came down to personal quirk. So these, uh, these uh, you know, foreigners who came to India, you know, uh, did they settle down, did they, you know, marry locally, did, you know, so in that sense, our DNA is, is a hodgepodge. And you know, that's not us, everybody's DNA is a hodgepodge. This search for a pristine culture, as though culture is a rock that you put in a box and lock away forever, that's, that again reflects our insecurities in the present. Culture is a breathing, evolving thing that gives and takes. The Hindus gave the zero to the world, but they took a lot of ideas from other parts of the world as well. And it's not some competition. Correct. It's not like, oh, you know, you gave me this, so I must give you three times more. Yeah. That's, that's not how it works. Yeah. People move, cultures move, ideas travel. Ideas can't be blocked in one place or locked up in the room. Yeah. That's just the natural course of things. Yeah. So, you know, this, this notion that somehow these things didn't happen. The other thing is, you know, again, I'll cite the Peshwa records. It hasn't made it to this collection of essays. But you look at the Peshwa Kotwal records, police records. There's a fascinating record of a man who was accused by his daughter-in-law of, of trying to rape her. His defense was, oh, I was on the way to the toilet and I fell on her. I tripped and fell. The funny thing is, about five, six years ago in London, there was a Saudi diplomat or something who tried yes, to yes, uh, yes. follow her, a young girl or yes, something. And he yes. defended himself saying, oh, I was on the way to the toilet and I tripped and fell on her. Yes. Two centuries separate these stories, but the exact same drastic reaction. You find uh, there's, there's this record of a woman who tried to murder her husband by mixing crushed glass in the atta. So she's trying to feed her husband murderous you know, toxic thing, but that exists. So again, this, this is in the late 18th century, but they had their problems, they had their lynchings, they had their law and order issues, uh, and, and they had murderous wives and murderous and, and rapist husbands and people like that, because people don't change. You know, that is a constant. So this, this, this search for the pristine somehow assumes that people in the past were not like us, whereas that is a fallacy. People in the past were exactly like us. They were also human beings. Oh, so you, you're, you have a lot of stories in there of, and you spoke about those women as well, you know, uh, rebels and, and, and uh, defiant women, yeah, who were actually questioning people in power. Uh, but we don't get to hear these voices, yeah. Um, and you s somehow have been able to, um, uh, you know, tilt the story in such a way that uh, uh, it, it's, it's a female gaze, yeah? and that is what is missing at this point of time. So, are you planning to, you know, write a book just with a female gaze, or what do you think needs to be done? Because I believe that more and more, you know, uh, voices of women and these characters need to be known. So uh, the thing is, you know, women are there. You you discover that uh, you know, in the Mughal court, for example, you assume that the begums are all locked up in the harem and they were just lounging about, you know, true. completely drenched in perfume and wearing their pearls and silks or whatever. But they were actually big, big business magnates. They had a lot of authority. Jodha. The harem was an institution. Yes. So the Akbar's wife, the Rajput lady, popularly called Jodha Bai, her name wasn't actually Jodha Bai. Her official title was Maryam Uzamani. She was one of the biggest shipping magnates of her time. She owned one of the world's biggest ships at the time. And when the Portuguese made the mistake of capturing it and burning it, she had them expelled from the Mughal court. She was outbid in Bayana in the indigo market. Her agent was outbid by an Englishman. She had the English expelled because she said, if I'm bidding, how dare you come and outbid me in the market? She was not some woman sitting about, you know, prancing about looking graceful all day long. She had business interests. Yes. She had a cavalry rank of 12,000. Yes. She could issue farmans of her own. She was constructing mosques. She was sending people on the Hajj. She was a, a, a practicing Hindu in her own right. She was a woman with layers. She was a woman who made a contribution. Uh, Mughal women also often played the role of diplomats. Now, you have a son who will rebel against his father. Now, it's awkward for both. The father has to get his son's head off. The son can't, you know, come back and surrender to his father because he knows he's going to lose his head. What do you do? That's where the women come in. So an aunt or a venerable grandmother will go out, she catch this guy by the neck, bring him in and make him touch his father's feet, his head on his father's feet. It, it sort of smooths over this awkward corner and they play the role of diplomats. In the early period, you look at the pre akbar Mughal women. All of them are known by their names. Gulbadam Begum, Hamida Banu Begum. After Akbar, it's all titles. Mumtaz Mahir, you know, Noor Jahan. These are titles. Yeah. Because their personal identities start getting obscured from them. 
Till then, they're riding horses. You know, the Emperor Humayun lost a six-year-old daughter in a battle. She drowned to death in a river while they were trying to escape. What was a six-year-old girl doing in a battlefield? Yes. The point is these women were there. They were actually present in the king's uh, moving court in his camp, and they were actually there at the battlefield. Uh, you know, Emperor Babur had a sister he had to abandon many years ago to a, to a conqueror. And many decades later, she came back to his court, practically by herself. So these are not helpless women who are sort of, you know, completely un 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 unable to do anything. They did make contributions. We've chosen not to look at those contributions. We've chosen to ignore those contributions, especially if they, as I said, don't come with that Mangal Sutra or on their neck, because we don't like this thing. There's an essay in this on Shakuntala. Yes. And the other is gone, so he, I don't know. He would have enjoyed it, perhaps. So, you know, we, the popular Shakuntala is the Kalidas Shakuntala, right? Where, okay, so one day the, the king arrives there, he sees this beautiful girl, they have this Gandharva Vivaha, which makes up for the lack of ceremony and patience. Uh, then she, you know, he gives her a ring. One day a sage comes and the sage sees that her head is in the cloud, so he curses her, saying, you know, the man you're thinking about will forget you. Then all her maids and Dasi's run saying, Ayo, Baba, you know, she wasn't, she didn't mean it, etc. So then the sage says, okay, fine, you know, the ring, when the king sees the ring, he'll remember everything again. So eventually, she's, she's pregnant, she goes with her people, and in the Kalidash, she's very coy, she won't utter a sentence, other people talk for her. She goes there, the, the ring obviously goes missing midway, a fish ends up swallowing it, and it turns up much later in the royal kitchens. Uh, and the king doesn't recognize her, because the curse is there. And uh, she eventually weeps and cries, and she goes away, and then that's how the story continues. But this is not the original Shakuntala. The, the original Shakuntala and the Mahabharata is very different. In the original Shakuntala, when Dushanta comes, there are no maids, there are no other people in the ashrama. Shakuntala walks out, introduces herself, and Dushanta turns around saying, Oh, Baksam lady, you were beautiful, thighs lie with me. And then she says, Fine, but our son should be the heir. She extracts from him a condition before she has this Gandharva Vivaha sort of thing. So it's a transaction already. She's, she's a clever woman and she has a mind and she says, My son will be your next ruler of your kingdom. And then she has this peculiar 36 month pregnancy. I don't ask me for explanations. <laughs> and the child is born and she goes to Dushanta's court with the boy. And there's no ring in the story. There's no ring, there's no fish, there's no curse. Dushanta deliberately lies. Because when this woman shows up with a child, he thinks, oh no, you know, what do my courtiers think if a stray woman walks in with a baby and assume and claims it's mine, I can't acknowledge it openly. So he says, no, 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 you're some, you know, don't birds lay their eggs in other birds' nests, etc., etc. And Shakuntala doesn't cry, she's not coy and upset. She turns around and says, you may rule the earth, but I fly the skies, and even without you, my son will be master of all three worlds. And at that time, there's this divine voice that says, oh, you know, she's telling the truth, Dushanta, you better agree, etc. And he says, yes, yes, I was lying. And I forgive Shakuntala for her harsh words, because patriarch is as old as any Indian tradition. <laughs> and the son goes on to become the ruler. So Shakuntala is not some helpless woman in the original. True. But why is it that we popularize the Kalidas Shakuntala? The Kalidas Shakuntala is created in a certain time in history when a new concept of womanhood has become popular. This, this coy, docile woman who's completely helpless and needs, you know, yeah. that's the ideal of womanhood at that time. Yeah. But more importantly, we've learned this because in the late 18th century, the, the Orientalists, the Englishmen of that first generation of the, who came here and translated a lot of our texts, they're the ones who popular, popularized Kalidas. So there's an essay in William Jones, for example. William Jones translates uh, the Kalidas uh, version of the Shakuntala. And uh, it's very interesting because there's this one line apparently where Kalidas says, oh, her, her face was sad, her shoulders were drooping, and her breasts were sagging. Now, when William Jones is translating it, he's translating for a European audience. So he translates the cheeks and the shoulders, but he leaves out the breasts because he thinks that's completely, you know, scandalizing for his audience back in, in Europe. But this play, this play becomes so popular, the Shakuntala of the Fatal Ring. You know, they, they're staging it in London, in Germany, there are Devdasis going out from India and performing before the French king and so on. And we thought Kalapani crossing is a bad thing. But, you know, this happened. And that is what eventually comes back into our textbooks. Yes. This censored, sanitized Kalidas Shakuntala that an Englishman translated is what comes back into our textbooks, which we have now assumed is pristine Indian tradition. But there's been so much filtering that's happened. And we have selectively read history because we're not happy with the original Shakuntala. There's, you know, there's, so, Everything about Indian history is complication. Everything about Indian history, you say something, you find the equal opposite. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not you. Anything you say can be, is completely false for another context, yeah. in another so, place, another corner of the country. That is what makes Indian history so fascinating because there's no one pristine culture. There's no one uniting cultural identity. It's diversity and change is the uniting concept. Well, she didn't answer the question. Uh, are you planning to write a book with the, you know? from a female perspective. So all my books tend to have, you know, this, there is a feminist angle to everything. Yes. 
partly also because my first book was about the protagonist and the so-called winner of the story. They're both women. Yes. Which meant that for six years when I was working on the book, it was just you know, trying to get into the minds of these women. And at that time, I read, read a lot of feminist scholarship, you know, J. Devika, Arunima, a number of feminist, uh, leading feminist scholars. And that has definitely influenced the way I, I look at things. In these essays also, you'll find several dozen are about women. You know, yeah. and, and how our, our, our perspective on women has changed. There's one, uh, so I don't think I'll do a, I, I don't know plans at the moment anyway, to do a full-fledged history of India told through women. Okay. But it's an idea I proposed in one of my essays where I said that why is it that we still don't have a, a grand history of India where it's female narratives and the men are the marginal background. Yeah. It's the female. And even if you don't have female characters, there's lots of female legend, there's stories. Now, a legendary figure may or may not have existed. For a historian, the point is not whether she exists. The point is what does the legend represent? That is value. So in the, one of the essays is on the Madurai Meenakshi temple, where you know you have this king who, like Dasharatha, has this big yagam, and out of the flames he, he wants a child. So a child emerges, a two or three year old uh, infant really, and uh, as soon as it emerges, the king realizes it's not a boy. On the contrary, it's a triple breasted girl. So the king looks up at the heavens saying, I wanted a son and you've given me a freak. And then the heavens say, look, she's going to become great, so you calm down and you, you raise her like, a, like, like your only child or whatever. She goes on and becomes a great conqueror. She conquers all the worlds, etc. And uh, essentially, Madhura Meenakshi was a, perhaps a South Indian pagan goddess who was androgynous. But then there's a final conclusion to her story where she ends up in Kailasha. And then she looks at Shiva and realizes, oh my god, I'm Parvati's avatar. Her third breast falls off. She becomes a coy, gentle woman. Marries Shiva and comes back and settles down. She's normalized. But even now in practice, Shiva has just got one tiny little shrine in the corner there. Yeah. Madhura Meenakshi is the main yes. uh, figure in the Madurai temple. There are sculptures that are absolutely stunning. There's one that shows Arjuna becoming Arjuni, where he's got the face of a man with the uh, you know soft Southeast Asian features, but the body of a woman. And you know, yeah. arms that are fairly muscular for a for a woman. So, you know, it's interesting, the sculpture, everything suggests this very gender bending sort of thing happening in, in that temple because the legend is is that. And we have these stories and they can tell us a lot about our past rather than the same kings and the same dynasties and five dates and battles. So uh, in the future, okay, if when history, when people are going to look at the history of today's time, yeah, and given that uh, we are, you know, the largest factory of fake news in the world at this point of time, how do you think historians, you know, 200 years from now, are, will be able to kind of separate truth from fiction? and made up news. You know, there's, why is it that fascists and anybody who's got something against the truth, as it were, ends up burning books? Because, you know, we may live in the internet age, we may live in an age where communication is easy and WhatsApp forwards dominates the narrative, perhaps. But at the end of the day, a book is a book. It may sit on a shelf for 50 years untouched, but so long as it sits there, it has value. 50 years later, if you open the book, you'll still find something of value there. So I think that is what's going to happen, where people, Often say that publishing is dying, nobody's reading books. Completely untrue. In this country, publishing is booming. Non-fiction writing is booming. You know, fiction has become so competitive that finding publishers has become a problem. Because people are interested in reading. We have a huge population. And right now the internet is new. Right now all of what we're seeing is very new. So it's not settled. We haven't figured out what this is about. Once it settles, people will be able to separate truth from fiction. They'll be able to understand what is what. No, All disruptive technology does this. Yeah. And the real, you know, this is one of the ironies where tradition has so much, you know, we, we again assume that it's this timeless, unbroken thing, but tradition has always made use of innovation and technology and change. So when the railways first came to India, all the big priests and big temple towns said, Ayo, you know, this is fire carriage, it's sin. If you get onto it, your, your jadi will become brushed, your caste will you lose your caste and so on. But then very quickly they realized that from Calcutta to the Puri temple, what used to be weeks of walking, is now a 12-hour train journey. So suddenly you've got more pilgrims coming and your temple coffers are you know, overflowing. And they said, okay, fine, this is great. They made use of that. Yes. In Trivandrum, uh, when, the, when the railways first came in the 1880s, the Brahmins said, no, 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 fire carriage, you know, we can't defile the seat of Padmanabh Swami because that's the temple there. It took them the 1920s to get the railway station into the city. Yeah. But it actually benefited the city because pilgrims came, more people came. The custodians of tradition always write on modernity and the instruments of modernity. That is the irony of all this. Even, you know, the biggest, you know, people who say that Indian culture means protect them, etc. Why are they using WhatsApp? That's not Indian culture. You know, why, are they, why are they using technology? Absolutely. That's not Indian culture. Absolutely. But that's the point. Culture is this. This is just how keeps, things keep changing. But books at the end of the day will retain a certain vitality and value. You may have 
you know, ups and downs. There may be a time when more people read it and a time when less people read books. But the point is, the value is always there. Uh, I've been having frantic figures from behind you telling me there's only five minutes. Uh, we can just keep on talking. I mean, I have so many questions to ask you, actually. Uh, but I guess 45 minutes is all we have. Um, so, uh, are we going to open now to uh, question and answers? Yes. 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 Okay, so the gentleman over there. Uh, am I on? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I'm an enthusiastic history student who's been finding difficult to find what is the right sort of narrative, right? Uh, so what has floated in our textbooks that we've studied uh, since the uh, school times and we come to colleges, and and then when you get into actually studying history, there's a completely different narrative, and and you kind of have this difficulty of understanding. Uh, that what people conceive of history, the popular idea of history is quite different than what exactly is the truth in the books. So how to, how is it possible for people who study history to mine this gap or to you know bind people to understand what actually is rather than a popular understanding of history? So the thing with history is it's always changing, right? So I've written this book now, in 20 years it will be outdated because more material comes to the fore, more people have new angles of looking. A hundred years ago, if you try to explain to a historian in the colonial era something about the feminist perspective, they would have understood what you're talking about. It would have completely gone over their heads. But today you can't ignore the feminist perspective in history. Tomorrow there may be an LGBT perspective. You have no idea how perspectives will change. So all historians, no matter what period you're in, you're never doing completely, you're not never claiming that you have the truth is what your, your, your books are saying. Because the truth also evolves in that sense. You never know. More evidence may come to light tomorrow. But the other thing is, it's all dots, right? We're all connecting dots. One person may connect it this way, one may connect it this way. The question is, which is the more intelligent way of connecting it? So that's why you look at your sources. You look at documents, you look at oral history, you look at multiple sources to try and get as complete a picture as possible. You know, for the longest time, history in this country was very positive, by which I mean texts, records. Where are the records? Records are what do history. But we lived in a caste-based society. How many people were literate? How many people were writing records? So what about those who don't have records? What about those who have folklore and song and that's about it, which nobody has codified? And we've lost so much in the process. There's something called the Mapala Ramayanam in Kerala, which only survives now in parts, because it was a Ramayanam told by the Muslim community in, in Kerala, where Shurpanakha, when she comes and propositions Rama, Rama says, I'm already married, can't, I'm so sorry. And then Shurpanakha turns out saying, but in the Sharia, it says you can take a second <laughs> This This Ramayana was never written down. It was folk singers who traveled through Malabar who sang this Ramayana. And by the time even parts of it were codified, most of it was lost. Because the, the, the storytellers had all died. And the world had moved on. So you have to mine as many sources as possible, as many, as many languages, frankly, as possible. Which isn't easy in a country with so many dialects and languages. That's a very tough ask. But only as you try and do that, will you find something that resembles the truth. Even if it's not, you can never actively claim it is the whole truth. If a historian claims they've got the truth, they lie. Because everybody comes with their biases, their filters, their own subjective uh, problems. Any, any more? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the mic. Could you pass the mic to the gentleman at the back? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, what do you think about Delhi? Mm -hmm. New perspectives and history. Because I know that the Kama Sutra, Ramayana, they all mention it. I mean, it's never explicitly forbidden. But is it encouraged? Uh, does it have a voice? Because even now, uh, three, Section 377 has been removed. But there's still a lot of stigma and phobia and you know, like, so how was society then, was it? I think it was in many ways more accommodative. I won't say it was completely liberal as we understand it today. I think it was always frowned upon at some level. They may be able to answer in terms of the myths and so on. But uh, there always seems to have been space for us. You have the legend of Ayappa in Kerala. Who's Ayappa? He's described as the son of Mohini and, uh, and Shiva. Mohini is who Vishnu in female form. So there's, there seems to be a slight Queering there, something happening there. Uh, the Madhura Binakshi, this androgynous goddess who's a, who's a very masculine figure with three breasts. There's something there that's, and, and the temple sculptures that I described in Madhura, there's something queer happening over there as well. So the stories exist, but I don't think anyone has really mined them yet to really understand what uh, the history of sexuality in Indian history is. There's someone called Madhvi Menon who's, who's done a history of desire, which is actually very interesting because it was when I was listening to her that I realized, and she's, she, she was completely correct, Indian goddesses never give birth. They're goddesses, but none of them actually gone through the process of giving birth. They've created, they found other ways of uh, you know, having children or whatever, but they've never really used their bodies to give birth. 
So there's a lot to be found there, but it's not happened yet. I think so. We'll have to wait and see, and we need scholars who actually focus on that to, to come up with something. The lady at the back. Uh, you spoke about the last, the last question. Then you know, there's uh, essentially what we think is Indian tradition is Victorian tradition. It's not really Indian. You know, when the Victorians came to Kerala, they were horrified to find that women in Kerala walked about topless. So the queens were topless, the lower caste women were topless. The first Brahmin woman to wear a blouse in the 1920s was ostracized and thrown out from her community because they said, if you're wearing a blouse, you're a slut. You know, there's this fascinating anecdote of Aubrey Menon, who's a half Irish, half Malayali writer. His book was one of the first to be banned in India. And Aubrey Menon, his mother was Irish, so his mother's come to meet her, her Naya mother-in-law. And the mother-in-law sends a maid saying, you know, summon my daughter-in-law. And the maid comes running back saying, Ayo, you know, she's sitting there with her breasts covered. And the mother-in-law says, she's covering herself, she must be preparing for adultery. Because in the morality <laughs> of the place, you had no reason to cover yourself. It was not considered decent to do that. Because, and if you're covering yourself, there's something wrong with you. No dignified woman would feel the need to cover herself. The British resident told the Maharaja of Travancore, you know, all your palace servants are walking around topless. I find this very embarrassing. So Maharaja said, you must all wear blouses. The, the, the palace maids would wear blouses in the palace. The moment they reach the gate, they take it off. There's this funny story I've heard from Kerala. An old man told me about this. A social reformer in Trishu, who apparently led a, you know, he said, I'm going to make all the Malayali women chaste. So he said, I'm going to take out a procession of women wearing blouses. So he got about 10, 20 women to wear blouses and come out in a parade. And this attracted such a large crowd. The women got so paranoid of seeing so many people that they threw the blouses and ran away. <laughs> because that was the morality thing. That was the way that culture was shaped at that time. But the Victorians came. So you have new colleges in, in, in Madras, for example. The Malayali man's going there to study. Where suddenly everyone's laughing at him, saying, Your mother's a harlot. She's walking around topless. We've got polyandry in Kerala. The women could have multiple husbands. So saying, Do you even know who your father is? Because it's matriarchy. So your father doesn't technically matter. As I said, Marani's husband couldn't even sit in her, in her presence. But this questioning led to deep insecurity within. And you have. The great Naya reformer Manat Padmanabh is saying in a speech, we must make our women chaste. The earliest magazines in Kerala say that we will not talk about politics and economics, we'll talk about uh, stories that energize the moral conscience. What is it? Even as you send your daughters to school, you're also telling them, wear a blouse, listen to your husband, give him all your property, let him manage things, become a chaste woman. So this changing of the moral lens happened in the last 150 years. That is what we've still got stuck with. Our notions on sexuality, our notions on culture, everything comes from there. Okay, so uh, I, I wish you would speak to all the moral polices that are, you know, right now in our country so that they can get a... Do I have time for one last story or are they going to yell at me? They, they're, they're pleading with me to stop the session actually because uh, I, there's so much we could talk about. Thank you, Manu. Thank you very much.